Today is November 9th, 1982. Yeah, you got a clock right yes, up here that tells you. Oh, okay. I see. Tuesday the 9th. Your last name is Whistler? Yeah, W-I-S-L-E-R. Mm -hmm. Mr. Whistler, where were you born? Harper, Kansas. What year? 1901, January 12. When did you come to Oklahoma? Well, it is either in the late spring or early summer of 1902. Well, you don't remember much about the trip coming no, to Oklahoma uh -huh. then? Nothing other than what they told me. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Yeah. Whistler, where were you born? Me? Yes, yes ma'am. I'm a poor in um, Danville, Illinois. What year? I know it's not polite to ask the lady. I don't mind, and I'm a year younger than he is. <laughs> December 12, 1901. We were both 1901. Just exactly 11 months difference. When did you come to Oklahoma? What? When did you first come to Oklahoma? In 1905. 1905. Do you remember, remember the trip coming down? Uh, just, uh, I don't know whether I remembered or whether they told me. Just a little bit. It was a train trip. How, how was it? What, what were you told about it? Uh, well, really the only thing I remember distinctly is the fact that I was sick on the trip. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was five of us kids. And um, um, they dad, were, my they dad, were headed for California. <laughs> yeah, my dad's a carpenter, and he had come on ahead to get work and see how things were. And and uh, Mama had us five kids. We made the trip. We had a good time. Mm -hmm. Well, where did you settle in Oklahoma? What part? Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City. Well, really in Britain, then. Well, it was Oklahoma City for, for about a year. And then he built a home in Britain. And we were lived there while we were in school. What's your first recollection of Oklahoma City? What? What's your first recollection of Oklahoma City? Uh, well, uh, we had, uh... Go ahead and close that door if you wish. That'll pick up all that noise out in the hallway. Yeah. We had uh, uh, a nice uh, uh, playground back of the house. Dad had even built us a tree house up in the tree mm -hmm. where we played. And uh, I remember, uh, well, I think uh, I do remember walking to school. It was about six blocks. And, what school did you go to? Lincoln. Lincoln. Lincoln School. I went there for about uh, uh, three or four months, and then we moved to Britain. Dad, Dad had bought lots and built a home out there. Where did you live in Britain? What? Where did you live in Britain? Do you know what the address was? Do you remember? Uh, well, uh, there's two schools there, and one was the Northeast School, and we lived a block east of it. But I don't know the, anything about the address. It was, um, I don't think we had a street number. <laughs> Mr. Whistler, where'd your family settle in Oklahoma when they came down? Uh, well, Dad drew that farm in the El Reno drawing, and uh, it was uh, 10 miles southeast of Weatherford, or now, 9 miles southwest of Hydro. You know the lottery they had for the farm? Uh, yeah, uh huh. And your father drew one. Yeah, yeah. They had the drawing in 1901, and he drew the farm. And he and his dad come down and cut some trees and built a log house for us to live in. And he brought mother and had a sister that was a baby, and he came down uh, just a covered wagon, trailed the cow along behind so they could feed me milk. Mm -hmm. Had a dozen hens and an old rooster and a cook, so they had chickens. <laughs> so they came by train to Oklahoma City? No, uh uh. They came in the covered wagon. Uh, mother's folks lived at the Cherokee mm -hmm. and they stopped over there and then they came on in this covered wagon. What's your first recollection of Oklahoma? Well, uh, my first recollection is on down the, on the farm down there, southeast of Weatherford. Mm -hmm. It was 
<laughs> they had Five Mile Creek run down through there. He drops into the Washita, and uh, the uh, earliest my earliest memory is living there. We had the trees. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. All right. Yeah, there was uh, trees along the creek. They used to hold meetings, revival meetings down there in the grove of trees across the creek from where we lived. Uh, they put up a big tent, you know, and a bunch of benches and uh, They'd uh, sometimes have uh, uh, built a cook tent, I mean, had a cook tent with a floor and big long table where people eat and really have some big camp meetings last a whole week or ten days, you know. How far is your farm from the Washita River? Well, you'd be quite a ways from Washita River. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't remember just where the Washita does go through down the end. What was the nearest town to your farm? Uh, Hydro. It's nine miles to Hydro. However, they did their trading at Weatherford because they had better roads in Weatherford. It was ten miles. But... Can both of you tell me some of the games you played as kids? Can you remember any games you played as a kid? Well, we played black man a lot. How do you play that? Huh? How do you play that? What? How do you play black man? Uh, how do I see? You line up two, two sections, one on one side and one on the other, and then you uh, run across from one to another and they're supposed to catch you. And when you run across. Whoever is it catches you. Yeah. Right? That's it. And it was fun. It doesn't sound very funny, but it was fun. What else did you play? Uh, we played croquet a lot. Dad had a set by the house, and we all, the neighbor children and all of us, played croquet a lot. And um, uh, I'm trying to think. We had another game that we played where we were in a, we're in a circle. And uh, they put one in the middle, and they were supposed to catch you as you came in and out. I don't remember the name of it, but it was it was fun. Sir, what game? What kind of games do you play? Well, uh, out there on the farm, it's just my two sisters and myself, and we uh, did a lot of wading in the creek down there, playing in the creek, and and uh, they had their Dolls and doll buggies, they pushed around some, and I had uh, a little wagon that I pulled around and hauled stuff in, and we just, uh, that's about all that we did. We just entertained ourselves playing around up and down that creek bottom. What were your parents' names? Uh, Dad, was, the name was Cornelius. My mother's name was Bertha. What was your mother's maiden name? Miller. And where were they from? Well, uh, her folks uh, were in that 89ers business, you know, up there around Cherokee. They had a farm there five miles southwest of Cherokee. And uh, they uh, lived in the sod house at that time. I don't, uh, I don't, uh, well, they was using the old sod house as a chicken house, my earliest memory. Anyway, Grandpa built a wooden house. They used the old Saudi for a chicken house. It's still a pretty serviceable one, huh? It's a pretty good sized boy. But uh, they had come out from Ohio and uh, lived up there around Harper until the opening of the strip and that's when they moved down there. That's where my folks was married. And uh, dad, his folks had uh, lived there north of Harper, Kansas on the farm. Mm -hmm. Where were your parents from? Hmm? Where were your parents from? And what were their names? Uh, McCormick. Uh 
McCormick. Their uh, father and mother came over from Ireland when they were about 15. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't meet till after they were over here, but they did come over about the same time. And uh, they, they lived in Talbot, Indiana, his folks did. Mm -hmm. What was your mother's maiden name? Rachel, Rachel Jane. And where Nelson, was she from? Nelson. And his name was Bernard. Mm -hmm. Where was your mother from? Uh, she was born in Corrigan, wasn't it? Yeah, Indiana? Corrigan, Indiana. Mm -hmm. They were right close to the Ohio River. Do you? Let's see. Do you remember Statehood Day? Uh, oh, do you remember Statehood Day, November sixteenth, nineteen seven? No, no. I remember lots of tales about it, but I don't remember it myself. Do you know what some what, what are some of the tales they told you? What? What are some of the tales they told you about it? About statehood day. What did he say? He wanted to know what some of the tales you heard about statehood day. They had some big celebrations here in Oklahoma oh, City, didn't they? Yes, yes, they had lots of celebrations and they had lots of marches, bands, and it was just like a, a parade on Governor's Day. I mean, it was a big celebration, but I just remember the tales of it. What's Governor's Day? What is Governor's Day? Uh, You're talking about the inaugural parades, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, I can't remember back that first name. Uh, Haskell? Who? Haskell? Well, Haskell was one of them. Well, he, he was the first governor. Yeah, yeah. There was another one that was more influential, but I don't remember his name. He lived on the west side of Oklahoma City. Uh, I can't think of his name. He was a later governor, though. Yes, he was later. Mm -hmm. Sir, do you remember Statehood Day? Mm -hmm. No, uh, out there in the country, they we, we just didn't pay any attention to it. Uh, incidentally, my dad was Pennsylvania Dutch. He could speak the language, hmm. but uh, uh, mother wouldn't let him teach us kids any of that. Uh, when they were first married, my granddad had come down there and they'd talk Dutch, you know. And she just burned her up because she didn't know what they was talking about. <laughs> so she wouldn't let him teach us kids any Dutch at all. <laughs> Do you remember World War One? Oh, yes. Yeah, I was just anxious to get into it. Were you in the military? No. The uh, Armistice Day was November the 11th, and I'd have been 18 on January the 12th. Mm -hmm. And I was just anxiously waiting. I wanted to volunteer, and my mother wouldn't hear of it. And, and then, why, whenever <clears throat> you got to be 18, why, if there wasn't anything wrong with you, bingo, you was in. You didn't. Uh, did you do any work for the war effort in any way? Uh, or oh, not uh, particularly. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Whistler, did you do any war work, war effort during the First World War? Uh, not in the First War, no. I was only about 17. Mm -hmm. Well, my sisters knit sweaters. Didn't you do any of that? No. Well, my sisters both were knitting sweaters. I never did. I never did learn to knit. In the 1920s, what kind of dresses did you wear? What? What kind of dresses did you wear in the 1920s? I think that we wore long ones. <laughs> you weren't a flapper then. No, I wasn't a flapper. <laughs> what is a flapper? Well, I, I don't know how to explain it, really. All I remember is their little short, tight dresses that were over they did those jigs. The Charleston? Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, 
did both of you, were you four votes for women? What? Were you four votes for women? Yeah. You were for it? Yeah. Sure am. How about you, Mr. Whisper? You mean the C R A No, no, this is back in the 20s when oh, women yeah, got the vote. Absolutely. Woman suffrage. Yeah, woman that suffrage. Woman suffrage, I don't know what you use. Yeah. Excuse Mrs. Me. Whisper, were you a suffragette? Were you a suffragette? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. When the stock market crashed, what were you all doing? 1929. Well, I was, uh, I heard all about it. I was at the office, I'm sure. You at the office? You were? I, I worked for the telephone company. When do you all, when, when do you marry? Uh, July the 28th, 1925. 1925. Uh-huh. Right in the roaring 20s. Yeah. In Oklahoma City? Yeah. Yeah, my folks moved to Bethany in October 1919. What was Bethany like in 1919? Oh, it was just a nice little quiet town. Uh, we had uh, three telephones in town on the rural line, one at each one of the grocery stores, and uh, Lee Woodruff, a contractor, had the other one, and he lived with his mother. And she didn't like to be bothered, so people all had to go to the grocery store if they wanted to make a call mm -hmm. until they put in a telephone exchange out there. I was going to ask you, what was Weatherford like in the early days? Oh, it was just a nice little town. Uh, uh, incidentally, uh, my uh, dad helped organize the old Farmers Mutual Telephone company that was out there and it was years that uh, when the Pioneer Telephone Company put in an exchange by and two exchanges there in town and a bunch of those old Dutchmen while they was using the Farmers Mutual and and the, a lot of the city residents they had Pioneer mm -hmm. and uh, yeah Dan helped organize that baby and it operated for years and years before they finally Got away with it is a nuisance because the grocery stores had to have two telephones because uh, those rural people calling in they wanted to order groceries sometimes. So it, is, it is a nuisance, but uh, yeah, Weatherford is just nice, quite little town, man. Were the streets paved? No, no. The first pavement I ever saw was. Uh, we made a trip to Oklahoma City about 1917, I think, and they had uh, some brick pavement in Clinton. And, oh yeah, they had uh, some brick pavement also in Elk City. They had mm -hmm. that strip of Main Street there that is brick paving. Mm -hmm. But that is the first paving I ever saw. <laughs> Mrs. Whistler, what what's your first recollections of Britain? Of Britain? Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, when Dad first went out there, it, before we could move, he built a, a two-story barn, and he built the upstairs for living quarters. And I remember going up the steps and and uh, going up there to play and for our meals. And well, we lived there, and uh, I guess we lived there over a year while he was building our home. And uh, other than playing outdoors and going to school, that's really my first recollection. Mm -hmm. What did you all do during the Depression? During the Dust Bowl? What did we want? What, what did you do during the Dust Bowl? Uh, I don't remember just where we... I believe we were at Bethany. Yeah, we were living in Bethany then. And. Um, there was time after time that I swept out the front room with a broom, swept the dust out. Uh, did you try to keep the dust out? I tried to, but it was almost impossible. Yeah. What did you do? Other than just sweep it out, about all we did do. Yeah. You put anything over the windows or anything to try to keep the dust out, or? No, I don't remember that we did. No, I don't think so. 
How long would the dust storms last? Hmm? How long would the dust storms last? Oh, uh, they last all afternoon sometimes. Uh, they'd start in just coming in rather lightly and just keep increasing. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, the house was usually full of dust by the evening. You had to sweep it out? And it was, it was deep. About two or three inches. No, that's too deep now. Like that. Well, I, I don't know. It was by the door there. It was almost. Well, no, it might pile up by the door. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, of course, it wasn't right inside the house. Now, sir, were you working for the telephone company during the Depression? Yeah. And so you had a steady job during the whole Depression. Then. Yeah. Yeah, I used to. I I did. Uh, I used to buy bread down there at the bakery. You can get a hundred loaves of bread, day old bread, for a dollar. One pound loaves. And I'd buy a dollar worth of bread, put it in the back end of the car, and I had uh, a little run I'd make, and I'd give a, about half of it to somebody to eat, you know. There's one old boy that, uh, I used to drop off, they lived over towards the eastern part of Oklahoma City, and I'd drop off, oh, 20 to 25 loaves of bread over there a week. And they told me one week that there was one week that all they had to eat was uh, bread and sorghum molasses and Irish potatoes. The old man and the two boys, they'd gone out and helped a fella dig his potatoes, and he said, boys, I can't pay you any money, but I'll give you potatoes and sorghum molasses if you'll help me. And so they went to work, got their sorghum molasses and taters, and they said all they had to eat one week was taters and <laughs> had sorghum molasses. What did you do with the phone company? I was in the accounting department. How long did you work for them? 39 years and a few months. 39 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I retired February 1, 66. Mm -hmm. That's Southwestern Bell? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. December 7, 1941. What were you doing? December 7, 1941. Pearl Harbor Day. Wow. He said, that's the day they declared war. Yeah. I know where I was. What were you doing? Mm -hmm. I, we were astonished. Uh, myself and my two brothers were sitting down in front of the TV. You mean radio? I mean radio and listening to it when it came over the air. And it just, uh, it was astonishing. Mm -hmm. So what were you doing? Just sitting there listening to programs. Mm -hmm at the time when they broke in with that So day. you both were together then when you when you uh, heard it? Uh, no, I wasn't there and it's her brother she was yeah. talking about. And where, where were you when? I probably was at the office. Well, Sunday morning? Oh yeah, that, that's right, that was on Sunday morning. Yeah, I guess I was there at all. We didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what to think. Uh, what did you all do for the war effort during the Second World War? You know, I made a mistake there. I don't think it was my brothers. I think it was our two boys that were, we were listening. Yeah. Were they, they old were. enough? Sure they were. Well, that's who uh, we were all listening to a program, a Sunday morning program. Uh, One of what made me think it was my brothers. Uh, Cece was born in 26. See, he had been... Uh, Fifteen years old. Yeah. Yeah, they knew all about it. Mrs. Whistler, what did you do during World War II for the war effort? Uh, I worked for the Red Cross. What did you do? Uh, mostly typing. I was a good typist, and they had all oodles of it to do. Mm -hmm. Was that here in Oklahoma City? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Also, I wrapped bandages, uh, Red Cross bandages. How'd you wrap them? How? Mm -hmm. We had certain certain uh, reams of material that we had to cut to a certain size and fold, and 
I said rat, but it was kind of a folded package, mm -hmm. one after another that they sent to the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. We call them bandages. I guess they wound up that way. Now, were you strictly a volunteer for the Red Cross? What? Were you a volunteer for the Red Cross, or were you a paid employee? Yes, I was a volunteer. Just a volunteer. Did you, like, did you help when the troops came through in the train, like in the canteen, Red Cross canteen? You do any work out there? No. Oh, she was in the office. Okay, just strictly the office. Uh huh. Okay. Sir, what did you do? Well, I, I used to go down there. I guess it was on Saturday, and I had L.D. Lacey and a bunch of them had the, what they called the war dads, and uh, they had that old building, uh, used to be a furniture store on the north side of Main Street down there about Walker, and uh, had rows of cops up there on the floors, and I'd take one of those floors, and we'd check those guys in, get them to bed, and go down and about two o'clock in the morning and have some coffee and donuts and go home. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was in the war dad's effort. Well, she was too in the auxiliary. Later on. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Any of your boys go to the service during the war? Yeah, uh, two of them. What they do in the, in the war? Well, the oldest boy was in that uh, cadet program. ROTC? No, it is a, they uh, organized a cadet program in Air Force, mm -hmm. and uh, they just signed up for that, and he was only in 11 months because they discontinued the program. Uh, and then they had to either volunteer to go in some other phase of the services, or they'd give him a discharge, so they sent him home. Mm -hmm. But the other one, why... He was in the late war effort, and he was... Uh, and in, Bob? Well, Bob wasn't in the Bob was Korean War. Oh. But uh, Clifford, uh, he was in Alaska uh, on... Uh, they were monitoring radio signals up there, I suppose. It was some of the Russian stuff. That yeah, the Russians and Japanese? Some of that, uh, he, uh, he never did expand on it. Mm -hmm. He was in that army security. Yeah. What were you doing on the uh, BE day when the Germans surrendered? What was Oklahoma City like when Germany surrendered? Well, uh, you mean in World War II? Right. They kind of went wild. Uh, I remember more about World War I than the World War II oh. celebration. Okay, what happened in World War I? We was over there at Watonga, and uh, they uh, had an anvil out there that they was put powder in there and put this anvil on top of that container and touch off the fuse, and it blowed up higher than those one-story buildings, and it come back down the next uh, morning while those <laughs> that street was just talked with it because that hand bullet sometimes hit to the point down to go and scoop out a pretty good pile of dirt and get a grader in there to put all it up. We're that just was, dirt streets then. That was November 11th? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, they went to, I, I stood down there on the sidewalk and watched that hand bullet go up in the air for I don't know how long. That is a big event. Mrs. Whistler? Do you remember Armistice Day? I was just thinking. I don't remember much about it. Mm -hmm. I know it was hilarious. I mean, everybody was having a good time. Mm -hmm. They, as he said, they just went wild. What about during World War II and VJ Day, when World War II was over? When the Japanese surrendered? Uh, uh, when the Japanese surrendered? Well, that, that I was wasn't as big as the... When the final war was over, they didn't, uh, I, I don't recall if they did too much celebration on VJ Day. Mm -hmm. but they did, uh, when the final guns sounded. What was that like? When the war was finally over, what kind of celebration did they have? 
Well, I wasn't then on it. I I just can't be positive just what what, the, what did take place. There was a lot of private parties going on, a lot of celebration. Mm -hmm. Um regress a little bit. Um you ever seen the big flood that came to this area? Oh yeah. What were they like? Uh I saw what did you ever hear of a wall of water coming down the stream? Grandpa told has told me yeah. about it. Well I saw one. Uh my father bought the Bridgeport telephone exchange off of the Pioneer Telephone Company. And uh, Bridgeport, you know, is up on a hill overlooking the South Canadian River. And uh, they called down from Tologa to Bridgeport and told Dad that uh, they should alert any of them in the low-lying districts and get them out of there because there's a wall of water coming down. to Bridgeport and told Dad that uh, they should alert any of them in the low-lying districts and get them out of there because there's a wall of water coming down. And uh, they had it timed to where it would be there at about a certain time. So Dad routed we kids out. I had two sisters. He routed us out and, and uh, we got down there a couple of blocks north of the uh, where the telephone exchange was. And, looked off up the river and we saw that water uh, down below it was just a, a small stream you know in the sand and back of it it is oh maybe a quarter of a mile wide yet the water was just rolling and tumbling and there's logs and stuff in there. What year was that? Oh that would have been about 1909 or 10 somewhere along in there. Do you Remember anyone in Bridgeport with the last name of Reed? Reed. It was a Mabel Reed. Hmm, I can't. There was an Oliver Reed. I can't say that I do. The reason I'm asking, my grandmother told me the same story because they lived in Bridgeport. Oh. And uh, her name at that time was Mabel Reed. Uh -huh. And her sister died of measles in 1912 in Bridgeport. And her well, we left there about 19, uh, about 1911 or somewhere as long. Yeah, know. they lived there from about 1907 to 1912. Oh, and she told you about seeing yeah. that. Yeah, she told me the same story. She oh, said that, that was <laughs> wild. Oh, yeah. In fact, my great grandfather worked on the railroad and they had a railroad bridge out there when the water oh, yeah. hit. Yeah. And she said that uh, the railroad people told the workers to get out there and get the logs away from the bridge where it's going to go. Yeah. And she said, Daddy wouldn't go out there. He said, that bridge is gone. And sure enough, when the workers got out there, the whole bridge was swept away. Yeah, I can, uh, they had a, a bunch of cars on that bridge one time, loaded with rock and stuff to try to hold it. And, they went into the river and mm -hmm. went out of sight. Of course, she said all those men were killed on the, on the bridge. Yeah. Except her father, who's on the other side of the river. So they thought he was dead. You know, uh -huh. the bridge was swept away. And he didn't get back home until about three days later. Of course, they were Well, there wasn't any way to get back. I know, yes. So they just thought he was dead until he showed up. Well, uh, they used to, I, I remember, uh, we used to ride the Rock Island up to, Cherokee to visit Grandpa and Grandma, and up there between Cleo Springs and Fairview, there used to be a locomotive that you could see the top of it out there in the Cimarron, where it had, uh, it, they never, it cost too much to get it out for it, I guess. Did you know Mr. McCulley in Cleo Springs? I, I wasn't acquainted with Cleo Springs. 
it had he had built a sod house there. Uh-huh. And it's still standing. Yeah, I've seen in the paper. Yeah. It's a state museum now. Uh-huh. Yeah. And he's yeah. one that he just died back in the sixties. Yeah. I think. Sometime in the sixties. What about prairie fires? Oh boy, I I can remember that's one thing I can remember out there around Weatherford. Uh big prairie fire coming and everybody'd head over there with toe sacks and stuff, you know, to wet down to beat it out. And uh, see somebody uh, on a horse, uh, he'd get a bunch of stuff wrapped around with a piece of bale wire and tied to his lariat rope and uh, soak some of that in coal oil and strike a match to it and see him galloping down the line building a back bar. Mm-hmm. That's the way they got them stopped. They'd build that back bar and they'd beat it out going the way they didn't want it to go and when they met, well that usually was the end of it if they got started soon enough. How, how large an area area did those fires burn off? Oh several sections sometimes just depend on how lucky they were getting to it earlier mm-hmm. and how bad the wind was. Yeah. Real high wind you know and if they got into those dry blackjacks why is pretty rough. Mm-hmm. Um, what school did you go to in uh, Alba Hydro? Uh, there was a, they call it the Lone Star School, it was a, about a mile east of where our house was. Went there started in there and uh, then he bought that Bridgeport telephone exchange and we moved to Bridgeport so I finished up the year in Bridgeport mm-hmm. and I went to a lot of schools. I went to school there in Bridgeport and then we moved to Weatherford and lived there for a year or two and then out to Sayre and lived on a farm out west of Sayre and mm-hmm. went to school there. Finished the eighth grade out of Sayre in Seattle. Harvey and Winnie. Harvey Reed and Winnie Reed. Those names familiar? No, I don't. Just don't recognize them. They may have been. Uh, if they, unless they was my class, I just probably. Okay. Don't remember. Harvey was born in 1900, I think. Yeah, well, he'd have been older. And then Winnie was born in 1903 or 1904. Uh, she'd have been younger, see. So yeah, been, right. Those are my great uncles. That's. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. That Bridgeport, that is uh, quite a town at one time until they had their mm-hmm. uh, split. I know when we was there, well, the water tower was over in what was East Bridgeport. Mm-hmm. What part of town did you live in? In the west part. We was over there. The, well, they, we lived in there. Uh, we had quarters in the building where the Telephone exchange was. Incidentally, that is one thing I was telling one of my boys one time. He got a big kick out of that. Uh, this uh, store that we had the telephone exchange in is up the front. And Dad put in petitions to petition off the bedroom, and the back end of it then was kitchen and dining room, and just general anything you wanted to do. Well. This had a great big old pot belly stove down here in the <laughs> northwest corner of the store building, and the chimney was way back in the southeast corner. So Dad he run uh, his uh, stove uh, pipe over these petition walls back there to that baby to let it out, and, and uh, the next. Uh, Oh, well, he's going to have to get that sud out of there. And if one of them told him, all he had to do is just take that elbow off up there by the stove and take his shotgun and take the lead out of a charge, just the powder, and shoot right down the center of it and blow that sud out. <laughs> it did. <laughs> the concussion split all the stove pipe open. <laughs> My mother, I guess she was 30 days. <laughs> Ever getting everything cleaned up around there. And Dad, 
you couldn't have told me from the blackest Negro you ever saw. Because <laughs> that sucked him back in his face. And <laughs> all you could see was his eyes and his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So he, he learned that you can get the set out all right. <laughs> I remember someone told me about an epidemic in Bridgeport from the water tower. Yeah, the water tower wasn't in use when we was living there. They discontinued it. Okay, that's part of the reason, okay. Yeah. They said that they had gotten some bacteria something in the water and a lot of people in the town died from it. Yeah. What was Bridgeport like? Oh, it's just a nice, quiet little one street town. Yeah. You say there's a split in the town? Well, the split was before we ever went there. The, all there was over in East Bridgeport was empty buildings when we were living there. They just, uh, oh, I think that some of those black folks were using some of them to live in. What caused the split? Uh, I really don't know. There was a uh, Quite a ravine went down through there between what they called East Bridgeport and West Bridgeport. I think it had to do with the location of the depot on the Rock Island. You just down over a big hill from the uptown section. Incidentally, I rode my first automobile over there. Uh, there was uh, farmers. A few of them had bought cars, and old Godfrey Smith lived out at the edge of town, and he had him a Ford. He was a great big high business, and uh, he was going down to, he'd come by there and get some batteries put in. Uh, just common, ordinary batteries, they didn't know how to wire them up, they'd come down and buy batteries from Dad, and, and he'd go out and wire them up, so old Godfrey said, I'm going down to the depot for bushel of seed corn, said, would the boy like to go with me? And Dad told me to go ahead, and I remember I sit there on that seat, and my feet didn't even touch the floorboard. That is, that is back before the Model T, you know. Mm -hmm. That had been about 1909. And uh, so I rode down, get that, I was the biggest kid in town. <laughs> and old Harry Northup was running there. Uh, livery stable there and there's tra and a salesman coming in, you know it used to lease horse and buggies from him. And so he bought him a Rio and uh, my daughter's got a picture of that old Rio. But uh, us kids used to walk over there at the top of that big hill to watch those cars. Uh, uh, there's a lot of them in the early days they'd start up that big long hill, they'd get about halfway up and he'd stop and get a rock and block his rear wheel and <laughs> and, uh, and after it cooled down a while and he'd crank her up and it'd take two or three hitches to get up that big long hill sometimes. What hill was this? The, the railroad was way down at the bottom and there was a pretty steep hill that came up to the uptown part of it. And the, the uh, highway bridge, when they finally put one in, was down there by the railroad bridge. And they twisted around through that bottom and come up pretty close to the depot. And then they headed up that hill to get up to Bridgeport. That was the main traveled road, so they just had to pull that hill if they were going to go. A lot of them had an awful time following that hill. Mm -hmm. How many kids do you have? We had four. Four? Uh -huh. How many grandkids do you have? Six. Six. Any great grandkids? Nope. Nope. Not yet. Not yet. Did you, how many governors have you met in Oklahoma? Well, uh, I've never met any of them personally. That's how many I've met. <laughs> yeah. Old Jack Walton, when they, he had a big uh, buffalo barbecue and we went out to the fairgrounds, enjoyed the buffalo feed. 
Did you meet him? No. What do you think about his impeachment? Oh, they was impeaching all of them at that time until old Bill Murray got in. Old Bill Murray, they, some of the boys told him, said, you're going to have to watch your step or they'll be running you out. And he said, I wrote that constitution. I know more about it than any of them. He said, anyhow, who ever heard of a bunch of rabbits attacking a wolf? 